welcome everyone. It's kind of weird talking to people and not seeing their, all their faces, but welcome. I'm really glad that you've taken the time to join us and be part of this experience of learning to write our relations with the land and with food. I'll just give you a brief about writing relations. Writing relations is a woman-led pan-Canadian network of adult educators working for radical social change. We are funded by the Catherine Donnelly Foundation and use popular education to write relations. We are organized in hubs across Canada and in the West Hub, there is Regina, Edmonton, and Winnipeg. And in the Central Hub, we have Montreal, Ottawa, Hamilton, and I believe Montreal, um, I think, and Toronto. And in the Central Hub are the Maritime Provinces, um, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. Our priorities are to build capacity within members by supporting and providing resources for them to continue to do the work that they are already doing. We operate in a circle, recognizing our interconnectedness and the need to share our power and space equitably. We, we are committed to a heart-centered approach to leadership, which means that we practice the universal laws of love, respect, and compassion and empathy for all of our creation. And it also means that we ourselves need to do the work of being authentic and right with ourselves in the process of writing relations with others. We are radically inclusive. Our goal is to build trust and relationships as well as have a safe space to, to be and to share some of our challenges and be supported. We embrace the reconciliation movement to right relations between indigenous and settler communities in Canada and seek to build bridges across diverse peoples. Today, we are taking steps to right our relationship with our land and our food. I am pleased to introduce Mirtha, who will offer a land acknowledgement and introduce our speakers. Mirtha is a member of the Writing Relations Regina group, and she's a grandmother in the Western Hub Circle, as well as the 2SLGBTQIA Working Group. Is that an I or L? But anyway, I. an IA group. So Mirtha, there you go. Floor is yours. Okay. How do I do this? I just no, talk. Okay, press one. All right, anyways, um, good day everybody. And I found a message from Chief Jake Swamp that is giving thanks to our Mother Earth. So I'm gonna agree it with a few um, kind of additions and things that I did on my own. And it goes as it follows. To be human being is an honor and we offer thanks for all the gifts of life. Mother Earth, we thank you for giving us everything we need. Thank you, the blue waters around Mother Earth, for you are the force giving life and taking and soothing the thirst away from all living things. We give thanks to green grasses that feel so good against our bare feet for the cool beauty you bring to Mother Earth's floor. Thank you, good foods from Mother Earth, our life sustainers, for making us happy when we are hungry. Fruits and berries, we thank you for your color and sweetness. We're all thankful to good medicine herbs for healing us when we're sick. All the trees in the world, we're thankful for the shade and warmth you give us. We give thanks to you, gentle four winds, for bringing, bringing clean air for us to breathe from our, from our four directions. Thank you, Grandfather Thunder Beings, for bringing rains to help all living things grow. Elder Brother Sun, we send thanks for shining your light and warming Mother Earth. Spirit protectors of our past and present, we thank you for showing us ways to live in peace and harmony with one another. 
I was ancestor. Thank you, because you survived and made possible for us to be here. And most of all, thank you, Great Spirit, for giving us all these wonderful gifts. I also want to recognize how grateful I am to be living, working, loving, growing, and learning in this part of Turtle Island and all the first people who were taking care of Mother Earth and still defending her, the defenders of the land, the defenders of the water. So let's start with in a good way and see what our relation is with the land and Mother Earth. Okay, um, and I have the privilege to introduce a friend of mine, Kim Wengler. Kim is a member of Writing Relations for Regina Circle. She has over 10 years of experience working on the front lines of Regina nonprofits. She is the, co she is the community distribution coordinator at Regina Food Bank in Saskatchewan. Her current work focuses on getting the vulnerable and most in need community members nutritious food and support in their home during COVID-19. Her previous role was community greenhouse coordinator at the Regina Food Bank, where she focused on empowering children, youth and adults with food literacy skills to improve our community for, the, for the food security experiencing hunger and poverty herself as a youth, she's committed to providing her community with opportunities to grow their own food, make healthy food choices, and develop cooking skills to improve individual and community health. Kim graduated with honors from SIAS Kelsey Campus with a Youth Care Worker Certificate in 2010. She's certified in community kitchen training, food sanitation, nutrition coordinator, and is a mental health first aid adults who interact with youth instructor. Now, I will introduce our speaker who is presenting with Kim, Megan Sinet. Megan is a program facilitator and greenhouse operator at the Regina Food Bank. At present, she's working the front line in the food bank as a client service representative. Her love for gardening was inspired at an, at an early age. She has taught kids cooking class provided gardening and composting workshops and coordinated the urban agriculture outreach project. Megan is trained to facilitate financial literacy workshops and get kids cooking classes. In addition, she supports community members who visit the food bank to connect with other required resources in the community when needed. So the floor is yours or the screen is yours. Thank you. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, Mirka, and the land acknowledgement. Lisa, for giving a nice background on, on what brought us all here today. Uh, Renee and, and Angelica for helping to get this off the ground as well. Uh, it took a bit of nudging, but we are very happy to have been invited to speak about our experiences um, and talk a little bit about and give some practical information about how to get growing um, your own food, even if on a small scale. Uh, we are by no means experts, but we're happy to speak from our experiences um, and keep open um, to what your guys' interests are in the discussion after our presentation. So Megan and I, as um, Mirka mentioned, have typically worked in programming at the Food Bank in Regina. Uh, we've been very busy coordinating the delivery of food hampers as a response to COVID-19 in the past 45 days. Uh, we've actually delivered close to 9,000 hampers. And so most of our programming is at a hold uh, currently so we can figure out what that looks like going forward. Uh, but before we get into the practical part of this presentation, we do want to share some information about our experiences and the work that we've done here at the Food Bank uh, to help support people in our community to learn about food. Do other people hear an echo? Yeah. Possibly, Terry. I apologize for that. <laughs> trying to fix that and I will do my best to speak clearly and loudly. 
Yeah. So whoever's not hearing echo is the cause of the echo. Sorry, what was that? Um, everyone except the speaker should mute. Okay, yeah. That's another good point. Yeah, if everybody can mute their microphones, that might help as well. Uh, I can't do it. Could you mute um, mine? Yeah, I think somebody can mute yours. Lisa? Yeah, there you go. Okay. So in 2016, uh, the food bank here decided to use a quantit that it had already on its land and was utilized mostly for storage uh, to convert it into a place where we could grow our own food. Uh, the concept was to grow our own food and, and supply fresh food to our clients at the beginning. This is just a little glimpse into our greenhouse here. So what you're seeing is the garden towers that we've been using to grow food in. Uh, essentially, they are just vertical growing containers. They each have 72 pockets on them, which allows you to grow up to 72 plants in each one. They also, have, they spin 360 degrees, which is nice for working with the tower. Uh, the best part about them is they have a built-in vermicomposting tube. So for those of you who don't know what the vermicomposting is, that's just the use of red wiggler worms to break down organic matter into fertilizer. So all through the center of the tower, there's worms living in there. They can come in and out and create fertilizer for us. Uh, you'll also see there's a bunch of fancy grow lights around our towers. Uh, unfortunately, our greenhouse isn't your typical greenhouse. It doesn't allow a lot of natural sunlight in. So we do have to use grow lights in order to replicate that sunlight as best as we can. This is an example of some of the food that we have grown and packaged. So anything that we grow in our greenhouse, we package up and we give out to our clients. So whether we make the salads like you see here or use the ingredients in soup, but everything that we grow, we return back to our clients. And as we started getting it growing on this project, we had a lot of interest from the community, uh, especially younger groups and schools, uh, to come in and check out the space and learn a bit about how to grow food uh, and participate in, in activities. Uh, so we typically, with younger groups, weren't able to offer a lot of opportunities other than coming in and sorting food or helping them to do a fundraiser or a food raiser in their schools and community. So we were really happy and pleased to invite these schools to come in and start um, kind of enjoying the space along with us. And that's when our focus really turned to education. So a lot of the times we have kids come in and we do a variety of different activities with them. Some of the things that we do are plant your own plants so they can plant their own plant and take it home with them to care for. Uh, we also do just fun little scavenger hunts for the kids. And then the most popular one that the kids really enjoy is engaging with the worms. So they get to sort through the fertilizer and pick out the worms and in turn, it helps us and the plants. Um, so as we focus more on education, we wanted to integrate and demonstrate different equipment uh, and how to grow your own food. Uh, so the tower gardens is the picture on the left and that is an aerotonic based growing tower. And so it uses water and nutrients to grow food, no soil. Uh, and then on the right is the farm box. So this is a CNC farming machine. Uh, it's basically a robot and you control it from your computer or your phone using the software provided. And it will seed, water, weed, and it will sense the soil as well for moisture. So it's kind of gives a glimpse of technology and agriculture and gets kids kind of thinking about what that's like. 
Um, so what we did uh, in order to bring in larger groups of students as we were getting requests from classrooms that had 30 plus kids. Uh, so we kind of scaled back and took down some of our towers. We started with 48 towers and, and now we are operating with about 10 plus the aeroponics. Um, but we did this so that we could actually grow our impact and start something called the outreach project. So over the past three years, we have supported 57 different schools slash classrooms and nine different community organizations. We provide them with the garden tower and all the necessary equipment to start growing food inside their classroom all year long. Uh, everything is provided, sorry, <laughs> everything's provided free for the schools thanks to corporate sponsorship. Uh, and in turn, we asked the educators just to provide us with short stories and pictures of how their experience went with power in their classroom. Uh, at the beginning of the year, we put on an educators orientation event. So we ask all the educators to come out and we feed them, which everyone loves. And then we just kind of show them all the equipment that they're going to be using how to use it, and just give them some practical information on it. Then comes the fun part. We get to deliver all the equipment to the schools and give the kids a brief orientation as well. So there's many different age ranges. We have daycares all the way up to grade 12. So we just kind of go in and just kind of have fun with the kids and show them the equipment they get and how they're going to use it. So teachers have used the towers in many different ways. Uh, this really is up to them on how they want to integrate this into their classrooms, as they are the experts on that. Um, and so in these pictures, you can see they've been used for math, science, uh, art, wellness, reading and writing, maybe journaling, um, and tons of different outcomes. Community organizations that we've partnered with have also used the towers to support their life skills programs, such as parenting classes. Um, and we also have a couple of towers in women's shelters uh, that helps to provide a therapeutic support within the state. Um, many outcomes, like I said, have occurred over the past three years. Uh, one of the biggest ones is talking about food insecurity with these kids and just creating a space um, for them to understand maybe how their use of language when they're describing somebody who might be experiencing food insecurity um, may come across. And then also for those who are experiencing food insecurity to be able to um, have an opportunity to talk about it or at least understand it from a different lens. Um, there are many benefits to gardening. I think we all kind of have that sense. It helps with our mental health. Um, it provides nurturing skills, builds resilience. It's great for all ages. Uh, there's a lot of physical benefits as well. Um, and also improves air quality. One of our classrooms actually did an air quality test across the entire school, and their classroom was significantly uh, better oxygen levels and lower CO2 in the other classrooms in the school. At the end of every year, we go in, uh, we, we provide supports throughout the year as well as people need it. But at the end of the year, we are able to go into each classroom and have a bit of a celebration with the kids uh, and then give them a gift so that they can continue to grow their skills in the summer. Uh, so you'll see there is some pots and soil and seeds that they got to take home along with some really cool sunglasses. Um, so as we were doing the outreach project, we, we really wanted to also engage the clients we have walking through our doors every day. Uh, so we started something called the Indoor Gardening Workshop. Um, and so the Indoor Gardening Workshop is a beginner level workshop that lasts about two hours, that provides basic knowledge on gardening. Uh, we want to help people experience the benefits of gardening uh, who may not have had the means to do it otherwise, whether that's time, resources, 
uh, our funds to get started. So since April 2019, we have delivered 11 workshops to 95 participants. Uh, based on the feedback and follow-up calls, many participants mentioned how they would never have been able to do this uh, and have always wanted to try without a little bit of encouragement and information they received, as well as the equipment uh, that they were able to receive from us. Um, so all kinds of people have attended our workshops. It's been different age groups, experience levels, very intergenerational, very diverse. This is just a picture of the kit that all of our participants receive. So they get a nice big bag to take home all the equipment that they'll need to get started in growing at home. Thankfully, these kits are provided at no cost to the clients. And there's just a few different things in them. As you can see that there's a 24 inch grow light, seed, soil, timers, just kind of basic equipment to get them started growing at home. So now we're just gonna briefly go over our presentation that we do in our indoor gardening workshop. Uh, like Kim said, it's normally a two hour class. So we're just gonna condense it and just kind of give you guys some brief information on what we do. So when we start a workshop, we usually started out with discussion about what is urban agriculture? Why should we learn to grow our own food? Um, and we always get great feedback for that one. A lot of people will say it's fresh, it tastes better, helps the environment, reduces carbon footprint, so the food doesn't have to travel so far to get to our place. Uh, it encourages you to eat more vegetables. Uh, we see this a lot in the schools with the students when they put the labor and time and love into the food they're growing, they're more willing to try it. Uh, it's very rewarding, improves quality of life, builds resilience. And one of the ones that we always kind of had a chuckle about in our workshops was the preparedness in an emergency or a crisis. We always talk about zombie apocalypse and all that. Uh, but with the way of the world right now, uh, and, and there is a real risk to interruption in, in the food chain, it's really nice to be able to um, source locally. Uh, so we also talk about what plants need to go to grow, uh, such as air and soil are a growing medium, water and nutrients, light and temperature, space and time. Uh, then we talk about the edible parts of a plant. So we eat pretty much all parts of a plant depending on the type of plant. Uh, so carrots would be the roots, uh, celery would be the stem or asparagus. Uh, the leaves would be lettuce, for example, and we just have a discussion about the, the different types of plants. Uh, then we get into the fruit and vegetable growth stages. So this one I'll go through with you guys because I think it's really good practical information. Uh, so stage one is seeding. So this is when the life cycle of a plant begins, uh, when that seed is sown into the soil. Different seeds have different needs, but all seeds require the right amount of light, moisture, and temperature to allow for the germination process to begin. Stage two is germination, and this is when the seed is absorbing water and swells so that it can split open. The radical or the root tip is what will come out first, and it will force its way down into the soil. It actually knows to go down and not up, which is great. Um, the stem also then pushes through the soil along with the seed leaves. Stage three is establishment. So this is when the shoot emerges and true leaves begin to form. This is the point where the plant begins to produce its own food uh, in a process called photosynthesis. Uh, roots will continue their downward search for water and nutrients and they may require additional fertilizer as it continues to grow. Stage four is the vegetative growth stage, and this is where leaves will multiply, the stems will lengthen and thicken, roots develop numerous hairs and thicken as well. The plant will increase in weight and height, uh, flower buds may begin to form. This is the stage where the most leafy green vegetables are harvested, such as lettuce. 
Stage five is flowering. Flowering. Say that properly. <laughs> Plants will stop their upward growth and focus on producing flowering stems and shoots. Uh, this is a very important stage of development for fruit crops such as tomatoes. As any damage caused to the plant, and especially the tender flowers, will result in reduced harvest potential. Stage number six is ripening and maturation. So this is when flowers are in full bloom and that fruit uh, begins to ripen and mature. Plant will stop growing um, all the leafy green parts and will focus all of its energy on producing new flowers, uh, flowering stems and fruit. And then we go in and we talk about container gardening. So what is container gardening? Well, it's the practice of growing plants, including edible plants, exclusively in containers instead of planting them in the ground. So you can, there's tons of different types of containers. The garden towers are glorified container. Uh, why do we container garden? Well, growing in containers can save space, but it's also a small, smart alternative uh, if you're restricted by shade, uh, soil types, time, mobility, or climate, like here in Saskatchewan. Uh, container gardening can be done indoors with the right controls put into place. If you see the picture on the left, it's actually winter outside, and they're successfully growing in containers inside. This is one of our classrooms. Uh, container gardens can be more productive than a regular garden as you are able to avoid most pest and disease problems. So almost anything can serve as a container for growing plants. You want to ensure that what, that, what was in that container before um, isn't anything that would be bad for growing food in. So, we would recommend using food grade containers when trying to pick a container and also wash and sanitize that container before using it and in between uses as well. The size of containers you should use should be determined based on the plants that you are trying to grow and the space that you have available to utilize. So if you're trying to, like lettuce will need a different size container smaller uh, than a tomato plant. I'm just going to go through a couple of slides and show you uh, different containers, different creative things people have used as containers to grow plants and food in. Um, here's like a pot bottle wall. Uh, vertical growing is really popular nowadays, uh, helps to save space. Uh, tires, I, I wouldn't recommend growing food out of tires, but I thought it was a really cool picture and way to use it. Um, and then starting seedlings. There's other recyclable materials you can use to uh, start seedlings other than the peat pellets, for example. So uh, you have toilet paper rolls or paper towel rolls, uh, yogurt containers, and also egg cartons are a good thing as well. All right, so I'm just gonna go over our seedling method with you guys. Uh, I know there's lots of different ways that people start their own seeds. This is just what we use here and what we give to our classrooms to use as well. So you start off by soaking the peat pellets, which are the little fluffy brown marshmallow looking things you see in the picture. Uh, you put those in some warm water for about one to two minutes and wait for them to fully expand. Then you're just gonna create some little holes in the tops of the peat pellets and sow your seeds according to the directions. Um, you're also just gonna to wanna to take a little bit of peat from the side of your peat pellet to cover up those seeds when you're done. And then also very important is to make sure to label everything. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I forget things all the time. So this is just a good way to remember and keep track of what you've grown. So on the outside there, you can just see the radish, chives, basil labeled. And then inside the container there, they have little paper clips with names. That's what a lot of our schools have been using because the kids all like to have their own little seedlings. So this way they can keep track of whose is whose. But there's many different ways to do it. The next step is gonna be once you have your seeds sown, 
that's when you're going to want to add the lid to your tray. So that's just going to ensure that it kind of creates a little greenhouse environment inside of there, keeps them nice and moist. Then you want to cover up that tray. So put on a black garbage bag or a towel, whatever you have at home. Uh, and just to keep out as much light as possible. Again, that just allows moisture to stay inside and it'll prevent your seeds from drying out. Then you're just gonna to wanna to make sure to check your seedlings daily. And as soon as you see little signs of life, kind of like in the picture on the left, you can see the green poking through. That's when you're gonna to wanna to remove the cover, remove the lid and put them underneath of the light. It's really important to catch them at this early stage. Otherwise you're gonna find your little seedlings are kind of tall and lanky looking. So as long as you get them under the lights as soon as possible, that's best. And you want to make sure the proximity of the light to the seedling is at a good distance as well. Um, as you will, um, you want the, the stems to grow thick and strong and not thin and stretchy. All right, so in this picture, this kind of shows multiple little seedlings in the peat pellets. Um, when, especially when we're in schools and you have things such as lettuce seeds, which are extremely small, it's hard to get kids to only put one or two seeds in each peat pellet. Uh, it's also nice to put a couple in as well, just in case one doesn't germinate, then there's a good chance one of the other ones will. So once they're at about this stage here, about an inch or two high, that's when you're going to want to thin them up. So you just leave the best looking one and gently pull all of the other ones out, giving that one in the pea pellet the best chance for success. The only time you're going to want to leave more than one in is for chives. Chives kind of grow in little clusters, so you can leave all five or six seeds and seedlings that you put into the pea pellet. This is a good example of peat pellets that are, have just been watered. So on the right hand side, that one's just been watered. You can notice that the peat is a nice dark brown color. Um, between waterings, you want to allow them to dry out slightly. That allows more oxygen to go through. So as you can see on the left hand side, it's starting to turn a lighter brown color. And that's when you know it's time to start watering again. This makes it a lot easier for beginners and kids too. It's a good visual to be able to see when it's time to water. And then we move into transplanting. So this is about the stage where you would want to transplant into a larger container. So we always say once it's formed its first true set of leaves. In the picture, you'll notice the leaves on the bottom of the plant are kind of a round heart shape. Those are actually the seed leaves or the technical name would be the cotyledons. Um, and then the next ones that are coming up kind of have the rigid edges. Those are actually the first true set of leaves. So once those have formed, that's when you wanna transplant them into a larger container. And then comes harvesting. So we just remind everyone to ensure proper hand washing when doing the harvesting and to use sanitized tools for cutting. Uh, we just kind of give our participants a little bit of knowledge on harvesting the, feed, the seed, sorry, that we provide to them in the kit. Um, the nice part about the, some of the things are they're, they are called cut and come again crops. So things like lettuce, if you cut above a, about an inch above the base, it's gonna encourage regrowth and it'll come back again. Mm -hmm. Two leaves at a time. Yes. And then they'll keep growing. So some of the common problems that we try to talk about in the workshop as well is that overwatering and underwatering, and we kind of shared the visual already. Um, a lot of people really like to water um, and tend to their plants daily, and, and they think the first thing to give is water. Uh, but it's really important again to let that air flow uh, so oxygen can get to the roots. Uh, choosing the wrong container is also a common problem. Uh, if we choose the wrong size container, uh, you're going to have stunted growth in certain plants. Uh, lack of light as well. Uh, we want to make sure we're giving the right amount of light. Uh, they need consistent light 
is really important and that's why we provide the timer. Uh, lack of light is also can be an issue. Uh, and then also too much light, or what did I say? Anyway, pests. We try to talk about pests as well because, and, and this is a varied topic because there's a ton of different pests and a ton of different ways to try to mitigate pests. Uh, the best way is to kind of keep, keep a clean environment uh, and then also monitor and identify the pest uh, so that you can know how best to, um, to deal with it. Um, so we're going to get into microgreen growing, which is usually the most popular part um, of our workshops. Everybody's kind of interested in the microgreens. But microgreens, they're very small, young, and tender edible leaves. They're harvested just after the cotyledon leaves have developed, so those seed leaves, and before the first true leaves have formed. Um, the word microgreen became a word in 1997, but they're not newly discovered plants. In fact, they come from the same seeds we've been using for a long time. The difference is when the plant is harvested. Um, so, which maybe I'll just skip quickly. So to talk about when the plant was harvested, so you'll see there's the seeding, the sprout, and then the microgreen stage. And then you move into more of baby greens. So you want to harvest microgreens uh, at the stage between sprouts and baby greens. And we give out the pea shoots, and this is the, the, um, the infograph we use to explain that. Um, so what seeds can be used as a microgreen? Uh, the most important thing to know is that the seed cannot be treated because you're harvesting it at such a young stage. Um, some of the maybe um, chemicals used to uh, kind of help that seed, it would be uh, still there and not kind of die off as it's expected to if it grows to a full plant. Uh, so basically you want to ensure that your seeds that you use for microgreens are not treated. There are lots of people who sell microgreen seeds specifically, um, and this is really just, they've tested it for growth rate, they've tested it for the taste and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's the difference there. Some vegetables you do not want to use for microgreens, like potatoes, tomatoes, eggplants and bell peppers as they could be toxic and poisonous. Uh, so if you kind of just want to explore what you can grow as a microgreen, go look at what people are selling as a microgreen, and then you can go to your local garden center and try and find a similar seed um, as long as it's untreated. So why grow microgreens? Uh, they're very nutrient dense. They have delicate textures and very distinct flavors. Um, the peas taste like a pea. The radishes are like spicy, like a radish. Uh, they can be grown in small spaces. Uh, they're fast growing, so quick success, seven to 21 days. Uh, we usually like to get the school started with this because sometimes our children are having a hard time waiting for, for the other seeds to grow fully. So uh, it's, it's a nice way to keep them engaged off the hop. Uh, and they're very fun and therapeutic. So to talk about the nutrient levels a little bit, uh, the pea shoots, for example, one cup of them can provide 35% of daily value of vitamin C, 15% daily value of vitamin A, 66% of daily value of vitamin K. And in comparison, that's seven times as much vitamin C as blueberries and four times as much vitamin A as tomatoes. So yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna do a little demo here. Um, and I hope you can see us and yell at me if you can. But Megan is gonna show you um, how she's done everything. All right. So as Kim said, this is one of the most popular parts of our class because everybody wants to do these microgreens and a lot of people haven't heard of them before. So I'm just going to show you guys just quickly how to get them started and what we do with them. Again, there's many different ways that you can do your microgreens, but this is just our method for doing it. So what I have here is just a clamshell container. 
everyone can see that. In one side over here, I have little holes poked in the bottom just to allow for drainage. And then I also have another tray that's going to go underneath just to catch any excess water or soil that spills over. So you're going to want to put your one tray into the other. So now they're both together. And then on the side that has the holes, you're going to want to start putting some soil in. You're going to want to do about an inch or two of soil in the bottom of the container. I'll just put some of the soil in. And the next thing to do, which is very important, is to make sure your soil is nice and moist. So just take this spray bottle, give it a good spray down. Hope everyone can still see me. Make sure that's nice and moist and a nice even layer of the soil. Then I'm going to take my microgreen seeds. So these are the pea shoots, which have been soaked for 12 hours. Um, all seeds require different soaking. The pea shoots are a lot larger of a seed and require a longer amount of time, whereas the radish seeds are a lot smaller and only require, require a few hours of soaking. So I'm gonna take the pre-soaked microgreen seeds and just lightly sprinkle them on top of my soil. You just want a nice even layer. You don't want them piling on top of each other. So I have just a nice even layer in my tray there. The next thing I'm gonna do is just take a little bit more soil, just kind of sprinkle it over top, just kind of like salt and pepper. They don't have to be fully covered. Just as long as there's a little bit of soil on top, that just helps keep the seeds nice and moist and allows the seed shells to crack open. Then you take your spray bottle again, give them a really good spray, and you're gonna close up your tray. So take one of the lids, close it up, and then we always just take a towel or a garbage bag and cover them up, just like you would do with your seedlings. Uh, this again just allows, makes it so the moisture stays inside and your seeds aren't going to dry out as quick. So then you're going to want to check them daily. So just lift up your towel, have a check. Probably at least once per day you're going to want to water. So while the seeds are still germinating, you are going to spray from the top to water. And this will be once a day you do this. Give them a good spray close your lid back up and cover them up. Once you get to the point where you start to see signs of life, so you're gonna see some upward growth from your pea shoots, that's when you're gonna to want to remove your lid and the cover and put them underneath of the lights or put them into the windowsill for light. Um, really important for watering at this stage, once you take the cover off and they're underneath the lights, you no longer want to water from the top. You want to take your tray out and then just pour some water into the bottom tray. This is going to help you so you don't get mold or fungus on your plants. If you continue watering from the top, you are taking that chance. So we water from the bottom, put your tray back in and put them back underneath of the lights. Thank you, Megan. I call her Vanna White in class, but we won't do that here. <laughs> okay. So this picture here shows um, microgreens at one day old and three days old. This is kind of a good example of when to add light as well. At one day old, there's not really any upward growth. You can see the roots starting to go downwards, but by day two or three is usually when you can see the upward growth. And that's when you want to add light to them at that stage. And then these ones are the radishes. So again, one day old and two days old, showing when to add the light as well. So as soon as they start cracking through that seed coat, and you can see the leaves start to come out, that's when you want to add the light. Um, a lot of the times we get a question too about the picture on the right, you can kind of, or sorry, on the left hand side, um, you can see little white fuzzy parts at the bottom. A lot of people ask if that's a type of mold or fungus, but it is not. Um, that is just little root hairs starting to form. So as long as you're watering properly from either the top or the bottom like you're supposed to, 
you're not going to get any of the mold or fungus. Those are just little root hairs. That's a, a, a problem for overwatering. Typically, you'll get those molds and algae and whatnot. So, uh, the radishes, they always have these little hairs, and it, it kind of threw us off for a while, but we figured it out. And then, yeah, go ahead. And this is just an example too. This kind of just shows you a close up of one of the seedlings. You can see the leaves are, the seed coat is starting to crack open and the leaves are starting to emerge. So once you start seeing that, then that's a safe time to start adding light. And here they are at six days old. So on the left hand side are the radishes and on the right hand side are the pea shoots. So at this stage, this is when they are more than fine to start eating and harvesting them. Uh, and then I just wanted to show you a quick picture of the roots that grow at the bottom of the container. So this is the day that we harvested. You'll see on the left, that's the pea shoot root, and on the right, those are the uh, radish roots. Um, and so when it comes time to harvest, again, you can use clean scissors or whatever you want. You can pluck them out, just maybe don't eat the dirt or the seed coat. I mean, to each their own, but avoid maybe. Uh, and then you can store them in a air sealable container. Uh, the middle one is just a Tupperware container uh, with my pea shoots in it. And then on the right, those are radishes. And I just put them in a large freezer bag so you could see how much we got from this small clam shell. Um, and, and you can do any size that will fit the feeding of your family or the consumption of your family. It's also really important to, to not wash the green, microgreens until you're ready to use them. If you wash them right away, they're going to start kind of wilting in the bag. So just harvest them, put them in your bag or air sealable container and then wash them right before you use them mm -hmm. and store them in the fridge. Uh, and what can you do with microgreens? Well, there's lots of different things you can make. Uh, this is a pea shoot and basil pesto, for example. And, you know, people put them in salads, in smoothies, uh, eat them just as is. Uh, yeah, you can add them into soup. A lot of the time in fancy restaurants, they'll use these as garnish. Um, if you've ever went to a farmer's market, they usually sell the container that I was using. One of those containers, if not smaller, would be at least six or seven dollars at the farmer's market. Um, so yeah, it's just really nice to be able to grow them at home. It's a lot more affordable and you can use them in a lot of different ways. Um, so that's kind of it for the practical information, and I know I hope we're not going too over time here, um, but just wanted to touch on some resources. Uh, the University of Saskatchewan has a really great website and agriculture program, and they have a ton of resources and supports that they offer, um, how to grow guides or pest identification. Uh, if you send a picture of the pest, they can help you identify it. Um, or they can do calls. There's so much that they can do. Um, I think it's really important to use trusted websites, and a lot of times that will come from universities. Uh, but it's really easy to go down a rabbit hole on Google, and you will probably see um, conservation information on your growing question because everybody is kind of talking from their experiences. Um, but it's really nice to go to those trusted websites. Uh, West Coast Seeds is also a great website. This is where we source all of our seeds. Um, and so they have how to grow guides and other information. They also have a seed donation program. Uh, so they've donated some seeds to us in the past. Sask Waste, oh, and they're all organic. Sorry, that's what I meant to say as well. Uh, Sask Waste Reduction Council. Uh, they are also a great website and resource, especially for composting. If you want to learn all the different ways to compost, uh, they have videos, just like 60 second to two minute videos on all the different ways there are to get composting. And they actually have composting coaches that will go out to your house and, and support you. And that's in Saskatoon, but it would be great to start that in Regina and wherever you, everyone on this call is from as well. Um, and then if you're more interested in learning about the Garden Tower, you can check out their website. 
Uh, same with the farm bot and the tower garden, lots of information out there on those items. Uh, and if you want to learn more about the Regina Food Bank, uh, you can visit our website as well. And I believe we'll be sharing um, the actual website and a resource list with you uh, after this webinar. So our advice to you, uh, there are no failures in gardening, only experiments. Uh, continue to grow your knowledge about gardening. Uh, it, there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot to know, but step by step, just try things. I, I've had no experience really uh, before kind of starting at the greenhouse and I've learned so much just by, uh, just by doing. Um, have patience, don't give up. Megan? And then our favorite quote that we've used over the past three years here is from our favorite lady, Miss Frizzle, and that's take chances, make mistakes, and get messy. Right on. Okay, that is it for our presentation part, but open to questions and discussion if you there are things and y'all want to help. So. Nice talk, Jerry. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. That was really good. We yeah. appreciate it. Can you hear us? Can, can you see me okay? Yeah. Good, good yeah. job. Thank you. So Denise and I are going to see if there are any questions. Yeah, there is a question from Grace, I think. Yeah. Okay. Where do we get those garden towers from? <laughs> Um, the garden towers we actually ordered straight from the garden tower website. So they actually, we got somebody who sells them out of Vans Voice, Saskatchewan. I don't know where you're from, but you can source it from the website. Yeah, we're in Edmonton. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'm not too sure about people around there selling it, but um, you can definitely order on the website. There's a gardentower.ca. Okay, we'll look at that. It looks really cool. Like it's like a condominium. <laughs> Yeah. It's great, yeah. 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 And um, the other question I have is, how do we get some of your programs to Edmonton School? It's just so cool in terms of kids learning how to grow and, you know, the seeds and all of that. I think it's really, you know, positive for, for growth of a child. How do, we, how do we get your programs here? Yeah, we're definitely very local at the moment. We kind of just had an opportunity with the grant we got. So I would... I would maybe partner with a food bank or a nonprofit to try to get a grant to purchase some of the equipment. Yeah. And then I would look for corporate sponsorship to provide the support to schools and the equipment to schools throughout the year. And then if you ever want any information or uh, a framework, uh, you're more than welcome to contact us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very cool. Yeah, that was a really good program. Really enjoyed watching that. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? Yes, I have a question. I don't know if you can understand me. Uh, yes, I'm Samuel. I'm from Regina, Saskatchewan. And I have uh, some questions because I'm gardening in my yard and uh, I try to plant beans, red beans, um, but they cannot come out. Just maybe two or three, or maybe around, uh, let's say, more than, more than five seeds could come out. So I don't know, do you measure the pH of the soil to know which seeds or, uh, or which plants should be planted? Um, you can do the pH tests on your soil. Um, do you know how old the soil is that you're using? I really don't know because I'm still new here. Okay. I, I don't know. Yeah, because sometimes maybe when uh, soil is a little bit older too, it can be a lot harder um, and it doesn't have the nutrients in it as well. So maybe that would be a good place to start too, would be kind of um, just refreshing your soil. Um, did you buy your seedlings already started or did you start your seeds on your own? I made two, maybe two, two processes. One, I went and bought seeds and tried to plant, but they refused completely. <laughs> so when I got disappointed, I went to the store and bought some cabbage, some kale, and some plants. 
then transplanted them. But still, I, I still have a space and I wanted to do something and I don't know what to do because I really don't know what types of plants are good for Regina, Saskatchewan. Yeah, I guess some good ones to start with would be um, a lot of the ones we provide in our kit. So lettuce, radish, um, what else do we have? Chives and basil. Those are all really um, good starting seeds if you're a beginner in anything. Um, I know the lettuce is one that's really easy to grow. It's a good starting point. Um, I know tomatoes and cucumbers also grow really well here. Um, no, we, yeah, I don't really, I've never really grown beans very much, so I'm not really too, too sure on those ones, but. Okay, what is the best fertilizer or compost uh, that we can use that can help the seeds grow? Vermicompost, worm poop. Yeah, so in Regina here, the place we always go to, it's called Water Boy Supply Center. Um, and they actually sell bags of the vermicompost ready to use, no worms inside of it, so you can just use that right away in your garden. Um, it's actually a very popular one. They sell out very fast of that because it is such a popular item. And actually, you can go to them with a lot of your questions too, and they are a just a bunch of knowledge in that space, and we have gotten so much advice from them. So I would suggest taking some of your um, questions to them as well, and, and just having a conversation because they're very experienced there with growing food and, and, and other plants. Yeah, maybe try taking pictures of your plants or something and take the pictures in and show them what's going on. Yeah, and talk about your process to how you got to that point because, you know, there's so many things that could be going on with your plants that we just, it's, it's hard to really be able to say what it is without knowing everything. So, yeah. How much does a bag cost? Hmm. We, we, we produce all of our own worm poop, so I don't really remember. I, think, I feel like the 10 to $15 or something maybe, yes. depending on the size. Yeah. Um, but if you want to just worm farm, that's a lot cheaper. Yeah. My last question, I'm sorry to bother you so much. <laughs> My last question is about uh, <clears throat> um, what kind of, uh, how can we prevent pests? Because I wanted to have organic vegetables. I don't want to add any chemical that would uh, make them not good for health. So what can I do? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of thinking of asking Denise here a little bit too. I see her nodding her head, but like permaculture, right? Like the way you design things and the types of plants you use, some plants will actually deter pests. So um, I don't know if Denise, if you have any useful uh, suggestions or know where he can get some more information about that. Sure. Like, again, it depends on what you're growing. Uh, for example, I grew kale and I got the kale worms. So I, the first year was bad. The second year I harvested them really young before the worms came. And then this year I just planted less of that and planted more of the things that don't attract pests. So I find that like the cabbages, they get the cabbage moths. So in some, because I don't use chemicals either. So that's how I kind of got around it. Um, I know that there's different kinds of um, solutions you can use depending on what you have. Like there's some, like you can use hot pepper spray and you can use garlic spray and, and different things like that. There is the companion planting, which there is a lot of information available about companion planting. So um, like tomatoes and basil and, and different things like that. So you could, you could go with that. But mainly it's soil health. Like that's the main thing. And just when you were talking about the worms, I was thinking like, I actually have a worm farm, like a tiny one. And I was afraid at first of like what would happen with it, but it's great. Like they're great. Like they don't cause any trouble and they're so beautiful and they make this beautiful <laughs> fertilizer. So, um, you know, if you wanted to yeah, have your own worm farm, <laughs> you know, you could. Um, and so to me, it's soil health. Like I'm a big composter. 
So I create my own compost. I'm building my soil. I don't really till it in. I put grass and leaves on top. And I a compost is the key. So you could do like a home compost or get the fertilizer um, and add it to your soil. Okay, okay. Thank also, you very much. Okay. Is there not something where there's a mesh that you can cover? Um, um, like a net that you can cover um, the plants while it's growing to protect them from that moth, those moths? I, I really don't have idea where I can get that one. I don't know even what is that. I think it's like cheesecloth you can use, yeah. or a garden center would have it too. Yeah. But use cheesecloth, but then like you just have to put pegs in and then make sure that nothing can get underneath. And, you know, I, I, I'm not like as technical as that just because I, like I, I love kale, don't get me wrong. But like for me, not everything grows for me. Like I can't really grow onions and there's just some things I can't grow. So I just grow other things. Like, I mean, we're not gonna get everything all the time, but like I'm really good at tomatoes and herbs and you know, the things I'm, and greens, except for kale. So I just grow, and I grow the things I want to eat. Like you can do a salsa garden, or for me, it's herbs and greens, you know. But if you, and then I'm doing tomatoes, a lot of tomatoes, I'm going to try dehydrating them and try different ways of food preservation. And so I just grow the things, and I, to be honest, I grow things that are kind of low maintenance because I don't have a lot of time. So I also make sure to put mulch down so that I don't have to pick weeds all the time. And I, you know, I just, I try and make it easy on myself because if it becomes a burden, you don't want to do it. You don't enjoy it unless you have a lot of time, which some people don't, you know? Hi. Um, sorry. I had a question about uh, the towers. Um, also regarding pests, I've heard neem oil is, supposed to be quite good and it's a natural um, substance. Uh, so about the towers, maybe you already mentioned it, but what are the suitable plants? Uh, what plants are suitable for growing in there? Like, I mean, I'm sure like you can't grow tomatoes in there, but. We have, we've actually grown tomatoes in the top layer. Um, and, and I mean, you gotta get creative, but mostly leafy greens we stick to um, like your different lettuce varieties, kale, we've done Swiss chard. We've actually had a melon come out of nowhere and potatoes a couple of times. Um, but yeah, the, when you go to the Garden Tower website, if you do, they actually have a whole list of um, which for our which tier of the tower to plant what in, like that whole companion planting guide. But we have stuck with mostly leafy greens. And sometimes we don't use every single pocket either. Sometimes we'll space it out a bit more. We've tried doing uh, both broccoli and cauliflower before, and those are two things that we have found really don't work well in the tower. No, small crown of broccoli, very small. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Before I ask a question, Samuel, if you want to change the, co the composition of your soil on... Um, West on 13th Avenue. It's called Plant Ranch. And at Plant Ranch, they sell alfalfa pellets. Alfalfa pellets give a good degree of fertilizer also. Of course, compost is much better. But that works as well. The other question, the question I had was, in regard to buying seeds at the store, would it help to soak those or what would, I know that's kind of a dumb question, but. No, no not at all. It, uh, it just kind of depends on the seed. Like it's kind of good to do a little bit of research on each of the seeds. Um, some seeds like to be uh, soaked. There's even some seeds that needed to be uh, scratched is what they call it first. Um, some seeds, such as lavender seeds, need to be 
put in the freezer first. So like all seeds kind of have different needs to them and just kind of know what you want to grow and just do a little bit of research on it first, I guess would be the best advice. Mm -hmm. Soaking really does help with that germination process. You're letting it absorb that water and that's when that seed's gonna crack open and life will come. Yeah. Oh, wow. Thanks. Thank you. Hi there. I actually, I, I posted a couple questions in the chat, but um, sorry, I can't seem to make it for everybody. So they're all private messages. Uh, so uh, first, I guess I just wanted to identify myself. My name's Erin. I work with the city of Edmonton and I support our community gardens uh, projects here. So um, for, there was, um, a couple of folks interested in if there's a similar, like, tower growing program in Edmonton, and I don't think there is exactly the same program, but there is a school education gardening program called Little Green Thumbs, and it's offered through our partner organization, Sustainable Food Edmonton, so I would recommend reaching out to them and sharing what you learned here and asking if and they have maybe a similar program that, that you could access for either at home or at school. And then I guess with respect to the um, indoor gardening workshop, I was just curious if it's under the umbrella of the other uh, gardening program and if both have corporate sponsorship or if they're separate um, and then how the funding I guess comes for the indoor gardening workshop. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing the Little Green Thumbs resource. They are awesome here in Saskatchewan, too. Um, Egg in the Classroom, we actually partner with to help support schools as well. So if you want to check them out, Egg in the Classroom is great. Um, so as for funding for our indoor gardening workshop, uh, has received funding from about three different sources by this time. Uh, twice was through corporate sponsorship, uh, and once was through a grant. And I can't remember exactly what grant we went for, um, but that's kind of how we've been funding it. So it's, it's a bit separate from the outreach program, um, but it has been funded in three different ways. Well, I think they're all great. So great job. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Grace's uh, handsome man has a question. Yes, <laughs> he has a question. Yeah. Because like I think last month we, we uh, because we have a fire pit, so that means well, and then the wood burns, and then like the ashes come, and then sometimes we just don't know what to use to use for the ashes. But then now we it's kind of just like a natural fertilizer plants. Oh, yeah. yeah, we put it into our little um, gardening plot. So apparently <laughs> that also kind of helps to fertilize the soil so we're hoping to yeah get some results from our ashes as well very interesting thank you for sharing that i i haven't even thought about that before oh, wow yeah ashes are great for raspberries oh okay mm. thank you terry mm. i just had a comment as well um the um I, i'm in edmonton as well the edmonton um from the city of edmonton the community community gardens projects um they might they have like um different community gardens have their individual facebook pages and they share a lot of great information um i was trying to find i can't remember there's one that's kind of like a overarching umbrella one Facebook group and so people share a lot of different you know ideas um, of you know what to do for your garden how to do your garden and different stuff like that um, you should be able to find some good information there as well um, I know I've been following along with um, the one that's in my area and um, the city just delivered like the big um, the big things um, last week I think so people have already started putting in their things and plants are already growing and stuff so yeah it's it's wonderful to see and um, thank you all for this. Uh, it's it's been a a great learning experience. Thanks for sharing that, Natasha. Were you referencing the community garden network Facebook page? 
Yeah, that might be it, Erin. Yeah, I, I think that might be it. It's just um, people just share some really great resources, like what plants grow here and like um, like in, in our hardiness zone and, and different things like that. And um, I think I shared one on um, uh, about like which kind of like uh, to grow, like what you can grow in a really small space. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that's probably it. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to like find the questions in the, I wasn't really looking at the chat to be honest. Um, yeah. There's also like the, uh, on Facebook, those permaculture uh, groups. They're really good too for like getting information about companion gardening or even um, uh, like just different alternative natural resources. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And I can open up the floor if anybody wants to um, speak a bit more too about their any advice or resources. It doesn't have to be a question to comment. Um, hi, I'm Catherine. I just like to share uh, some information, um, like about the soil and uh, uh, organic uh, compost. I find out the helpful one is uh, from Costco. They have the organic one, and I mix it up with the soil, and uh, it will really helping with my vegetable. I have an eggplant and tomatoes and uh, green peas. Beans, sorry, green beans and uh, chili, uh, and I have outdoor plants. It's so beautiful and um, um, it's it's also boosting. I don't spray also like uh, chemicals. Uh, like another um, team member, uh, she told me about the neem um, oil. Uh, it's it's from back home. I think uh, you can find it in the Indian store. So Indian grocery, Asian, any of Asian grocery store. I saying neem oil, you added a few drops in the spray bottle and then you can spray it. And uh, uh, that is a herbal oil. It's, uh, it will help uh, reduce the ingest. Um, thank you. Thanks a lot. I just sharing and I will send to maybe on the website. I have nice, really beautiful garden. <laughs> thank you. Hi, Catherine. Hi. Nice to see you all. Yes. You all and uh, good to see you. Thank you. Yes, welcome. Yes. I, I, um, what I do, I, uh, I plant in a different way. I don't plant in rows. I plant in circle because I learned from grandma that uh, it's more energy to plant in a circle. And so she had a way and it was all the whole kind of a ceremony how to do it. You go to your left and you keep on going and you start in the middle out. And then um, what we grew, it was what in here they call the three sisters. Yeah. So, Orange Washington. Yeah, and we plant the, the corn in the middle, then the beans, and then the squash because they protect themselves. So um, it, is, it is really neat because it was a story that she was telling me too. So that's how I learned how to plant. And also not every year we plant those things or herbs or nothing. Uh, we plant broad beans because it was a rotating crop because the broad beans bring lots of nitrogen to the ground. And they're good and they taste good. So that's just what I do. And I know um, when I see plants who's friend with whom because I never went to school, but I have the grammar school in my head <laughs> that I know who is who's friend with who. I know that basil is friends with everybody. So if you want to grow beautiful things, just put basil things around. Yeah. That's what I do. What do you do? Yeah. That's pretty yeah. Cool. And um, also I, I sometimes spray mm -hmm. cinnamon powder. So oh. it's a really pesticide and insecticide. They don't like it. And um, my problem now I'm fighting with a squirrel. <laughs> that she takes all my plants off the ground and she put a peanut in there. Anyways, I don't know what to do, but um, I'll find a way. It has to be a way that you can do a treaty with the squirrel and she won't come and, yeah. and wreck my garden. Yeah. But anyway, anyhow, um, I love the, the bees that I have and yeah, because 
there if it works so far. Anyways, yeah. yeah. Lady relationship tips for cats. <laughs> <laughs> I have a comment. Um, I posted on Facebook some time ago that there were too many dandelions in our lawn and I was ruthlessly pulling them out because they weren't supposed to be there. And I was flooded with comments and people said, they're so good for the bees and you can use every part of the dandelion. And I mean, I, I noticed even in my neighbor's yard, there's a bumper crop, they're all over. Um, so I'm tempted to do something I did a few years ago and that is called Urban Foraging. Um, I have a book of, of herbs mm -hmm. and a lot of them just look like weeds. They grow wild. And I mean, you can, you can, a lot of things that people don't want to grow are useful for something. Uh, so you can, you can just go and, and pick them. And if, if they're growing in, in public spaces, nobody owns them. So I might do that this summer. You can have a crop of, <laughs> a crop of weeds. <laughs> yeah. A friend of mine made um, dandelion jelly. Yeah, out there's of a lot of them. Oh, yeah. jelly. Yeah. Um, and gra gra grandma's, grandma's, um, grandma's school is the best kind of school, right? Yes, yeah. yes, it is. I want to learn how to make um, dandelion wine. Yes, oh. it's good. They say it's good, and I tasted it one time, but I don't remember really. So, yeah, if somebody has a recipe, mm -hmm. shoot it my way. Yeah. Um, Aaron, I just wanted to show you. I can't type it in the thing because, as you mentioned, it's um, going to uh, it's going to privately. But this is the group Grace. I don't know if you're still on the call, but that's the uh, that's the Edmonton Community Garden Facebook group. Yeah. I don't know if Denise or Lisa, if you know how to get that off of private sharing, but I at the bottom when you see two. At the bottom of the chat, when you click on chat, at the bottom too, if you, you have an opportunity to use the arrow and the arrow can go to everyone or you can choose specific people that you want to send the message to. So, oh, okay. so far I've been getting more like regulation type um, yeah. comments, but no questions. Yeah, I think everyone's, oh, here, now now I can finally see the everyone comment. Before, okay. it was only only to the hosts. Oh, yeah. I, I opened it. I, I went and followed oh, and opened okay. it. Yeah. Or okay. if you want to say something and we haven't noticed you, just raise your hand visibly or there, at the bottom of the screen, there's also um, a plus sign that you can use to click on it. And then there's a hand of electronic hand I guess there you go like what Denise has <laughs> yeah there you go oh my god <laughs> thank you yeah. my um one thing I heard in terms of sharing for gardens uh, is that marigolds are really good for um insects in terms of getting rid of insects not getting rid of but preventing insects mosquitoes but there from the garden so and they look pretty too Hmm. They also smell strong, but I guess that's why they get rid of them. Hmm. I don't know. Oh They're good God. for keeping rabbits away too. Oh, yeah, because they 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 really strongly smell, and so they keep the rabbits. The rabbits don't really like it. Okay, so. I have the solution for the squirrel. Yeah, probably that. <laughs> he said yeah. rabbits, oh, not squirrel. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, let's well, hope the squirrel yeah. does not like the. <laughs> Oh, no. yeah. Maybe she's the kind of, um, yeah, no. Okay. Oh, that's good. I found that the mice like eating marigolds. Mice? Oh. Yeah. Oh. Anyway, I have another comment. From Plant Ranch, I buy fish fertilizer. Oh. Fish fertilizer for my outdoor plants. It works beautifully. The neighbors hate us when we fertilize because it smells like fish. Mm. But it works, right? Yeah. They do a lot of that in Eastern Canada too because. Don't they, don't they, the, the eggshells also are kind yeah. of fertilizer? So yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I like the worms though because they aerate the 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 ground and oh, yeah. then they put fertilizer and mm -hmm. yeah. No, I like worms. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mirta um, says hot <laughs> pepper plants and cayenne pepper to disperse squirrels naturally. Ooh, I have cayenne pepper. There we go. Yeah. I'm going to make a salsa for the, <laughs> for the squirrel. <laughs> and I suppose that does not impact the flavor of the food, right? Or the plants? Or not you have, what, cayenne lettuce? Oh, I, I don't know. Maybe it's just kind of adding it around your plant. Well, you can sp sprinkle it around because it's strong. Um, there was one question in the chat about, can you grow microgreens without soil? Um, and the answer is yes. I think I've seen different growing, growing mediums. You just need something to anchor those roots, right? Um, sorry, didn't somebody do cloth or paper towel yeah. as well? There's yeah. a lot of different methods. We've only ever tried it with soil, but there is other, other growing mediums you can use for it. Okay. Oh. Any other comments, questions? Oh. If you have a fish aquarium, that water works beautifully for house plants. Mm -hmm. mm. And then tea leaves are good too for the for the plants and coffee oh. after yeah the coffee grinds. They're good for indoor plants. And kelp too, I think that's a seaweed, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Kelp. Yeah. There is a question here. Oh. I live in a basement suite with windows facing north, south, and east. Any tips for growing a garden? Hmm. I mean, I think I would I would you could probably get away with doing microgreens because they're so quick um, in the window seal. Um, Maybe potentially, if you don't have any outdoor space, uh, purchase a grow light if you can. Uh, that will help with indoor gardening. And if you're going to purchase a grow light, uh, you can go with LED. They're a bit more expensive, but the, the output of light is a lot more beneficial for the plants. And they don't heat up as much, and it's lower energy efficiency. Um, the light that we provide is actually a fluorescent T5, because that's what our budget allows. Um, it's a bit cheaper, but it, I think it costs, if you were to leave it on 12 hours a day for a year, uh, your energy cost is estimated to be about $12 for the year. Oh. Yeah, if anyone else has any comments to that question, open. And the south-facing window, the south-facing window would be good to put your plants in if you need yeah. the windows. Yeah. I didn't even see that. I didn't see that either. I still have one question. Um, the house where I live, we just moved in recently, and the old owner had a section where he was keeping a, a pet, a dog. And uh, personally, I hate dogs and I hate pets. And I, I tried to remove the grass where the dog was playing, but I think the, the dog... Uh, had some poo over there, and I guess to plant some vegetables in a place where there were poo of dogs may be dangerous. So I wanted to ask you if you have experience, how long can the soil be free from the poo from the dog, or should I remove the soil completely, replace with a new one? What can I do? Mm. I'm going to deter this question to Denise. <laughs> well, it is, it is, it can be toxic, that's for sure. And also maybe plants wouldn't grow there, but also manure, like it breaks down with heat and time. So it's not going to be bad forever because any kind of pathogens that are in there will die off over time. So normally it's like two or three years to like kill it off naturally. So that's one thing. Um, another thing is like, like you would not, like if you were to plant like a berry bush or something there, that would be better than planting like lettuce, you know, something you directly put in your mouth that's near the ground. So, you know, it's a little bit of both, but 
you know, if you could, I mean, if it's grass, especially, you could kill the grass. Like, so even sometimes I'd put like a piece of plastic or a tarp or even and some other times I've like dug the grass out and flipped it over and just kill the grass, you know, and that will get you started to be able to like replenish the soil. But the pathogens do die over time, you know, so you don't have to worry about it being toxic forever. But three years, that is too long. Uh, <laughs> what about it just re removing the soil completely and put a new one? That would probably be the best. And it, uh, that's what you would want. Another thing you can do with though is like garden boxes. So you could, um, they're not in the ground, they're above ground. And then you would put soil in. So you'd need less soil, but then you need to water more. So it's a bit of both. But in some, like I said before, healthy soil, like it's all about the soil, really. That's how you get your good, your good plants. So you might want to do it anyways. And it is a lot of labor, like you have to dig it out and kill it, like kill the grass, but you can just put plastic over it and it will die eventually. So and dig it out. But yeah, and you can get soil delivered, like you'd, you could get um, like a yard of soil or, or fertilized soil, you can get soil and manure delivered. And then of course, just build up the soil in that way. So but and it depends on like the soil, all soil is different and plants require different things like carrots like sand and, you know, the nitrogen fixing and like it is a bit complicated, but it things will grow like seeds are amazing. You just put them in the ground and they grow. And it's just, a it's like a miracle. I just love seeds. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, wow. Well, it looks like we're hitting 2.30. I don't know if yeah. anybody has some burning comments or questions, but we should maybe wrap it up pretty quickly. Yeah, we can. Um, any more questions? There's just one comment from Grace, she said, thanks for the session. We learned a lot. You had my seven-year-old seven year old's attention for the whole time. Oh, wow, congratulations. Good yeah. work, Kim and Megan. Thank yeah, you. we know how to keep the attention of children. Yeah. <laughs> That's really good. I just wanted to add on something really quick that my grandma taught me that you should put the seats down with new moon. Oh, no. That you should put the seats down on the ground with the new moon. Ooh. The new moon. Yeah, watch the face yeah. Of the moon. Yes. Because she was really aware of the moon and the weather in there. So she always told me, put the, put them down. When it's a new moon, you start your seedlings. Mm -hmm. And wow. it works. Yeah. I can grow anything. That's yeah. a good tip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're about to close. Oh, sorry, Kim. Did me to cut you off? Go ahead. Oh, you're good. No, I wasn't uh, saying anything. Okay. I was just going to wrap up because, as you pointed out, it's like, just after 2.30. So as we close, we want to thank you and Megan. Thank you so much for preparing this presentation and thank you for the work that you have put into it. We surely appreciate it. Mm -hmm. I want to thank our participants thank for coming and joining us in this journey. Um, I really want to thank the Right and Relation Regina Circle for all the support and the help that they've given to make this activity possible. Um, thank you to Denise. Thank you to Mirtha, especially for being up there and supporting us in this journey. Thank you so much. Thank you to the Food Bank for giving Megan and, and the opportunity to sneak away a little bit and to do the preparing and the preparation and sharing. And to be honest, I really think this would widen the reach of the Food Bank in the terms of the work that you're doing and provide greater opportunities. So please let your bosses know we're grateful. And thank you to both of you. We're truly grateful. Also to the John Humphrey um, Center for Peace in Edmonton. Um, part of, they're also part of Writer Relations, but we really appreciate their support in terms of admin and helping us get this together in terms of posters and arranging. Special thanks to Renee to Angelica and Nixie who did the, the work in terms of the posters and entering the um, 
following up on the invites and getting the emails addressed. So thank you. And to the Catherine Donnelly Foundation, without which funding, we would not be able to do any of this. So big thanks to everyone. We appreciate it. And we want to let you know that next Wednesday at one, we're going to meet in here again. And we're going to be having um, our second in, in the series. And this one is, I'll tell you what it is, the right relations with our food, understanding our food system. And Denise will be leading on that one. And we'll be talking about where our food comes from, who produces it. In this conversation, we'll learn more about the food system, the seeds, the land, the inputs like fertilizer. We did some of that today, herbicides, fungicides, oil, and other sources and labor and that type of thing. I think she might even hit on migrant labor. So there's so much to talk about with food and land and people. It's, we all need it because we need food to live. So we're pretty excited here in Regina and we're looking forward to sharing more information and looking forward to seeing you all next time. So thanks very much. Big thank yous. Appreciate it all. All your support. Yay. Have a good thank day, you. good people. Megan and Kim, I know you gotta go. Thank you. You guys later. Okay. Yeah. See you. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.